Today we're in, back in Galatians chapter 4, and we'll be studying verses 16 through 20. Here we have Paul addressing the problem of the false teachers who were inciting this rebellion against God that was true in Galatia and this desire to go back to the Old Testament law. I'm going to read the text. I'm reading from the New King James Version. You might wonder why I switch translations, but I'm looking for one that brings out the Greek in a way that I think it can be best done. And I was looking for this word zealous, and that was found in the New King James Version, which is right out of the Greek. So let's read that, starting with verse 16. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now to change my tone. I have doubts about you. Okay, so here again we're addressing problems. In this case, those that are caused by the people that come with a lot of zeal, they're boiling over for something, they're, they're adamant, they're motivated, they're vociferous, but Paul says the point of this, as far as these Judaizers are concerned, was to exclude them. And as, as we'll see when we get to that verse, they, they want to shut you out. They want to make it so the only way you can serve God, as far as they say, is to do it under their auspices, under their control. That's what false teachers are like. Let's go to verse 16, Galatians 4, 16. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? This is a rhetorical question designed to shame them into reality. I brought you the gospel. I told you the truth. I've treated you properly, Paul is saying. And now I'm your enemy. After the fact, some false teachers come in after there's already a church after Paul had already um, brought the gospel, and the Lord, being true to his word, used that gospel to establish a church in, in, uh, in Asia Minor and Galatia. And so this is a rhetorical question, and it's to shame them into coming back into their senses. Now, you find this throughout Galatians. If you remember, uh, and when I preached... At the beginning of Galatians, there's terminology right out of the Septuagint uh, of the golden calf. I'm surprised that you so quickly deserted him who called you. And that deserted him is from the golden calf episode. And for Paul to go back to the Mosaic law after having received the gospel and believed the truth, is to desert God and go into idolatry. And this is shocking. How could it be idolatry to do something that at one time God endorsed? And so that allows the false teachers to bring their material in and make it seem plausible. We should never allow ourselves to be at odds with the gospel and those who preach it. It shocks me how little... The gospel itself serves, in many cases, as the touchstone for discernment. Whereas the New Testament makes it that, and those who love the Lord and are his messengers will proclaim the gospel, and they will make it clear and forthright, and they will consistently do it, and they'll be excited to do so. So we have an exclamation of this uh, irony and uh, 
there should be a love for the truth of the gospel that would have insulated them against the Judaizers. But it wasn't going that way. And notice that Paul doesn't tell them what they want to hear. He tells them the truth. I'm a very firm believer in that. That it isn't for us to find out what people want to hear and make sure they get that. Is for us to proclaim the truth of the gospel. And if there's certain things that are not popular, it doesn't mean we shouldn't preach them. Even when the gospel's rejected, we have to be faithful to it to preach it. Oops, I went the wrong way. Verse 17, again citing the New King James Version. They zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be jealous for them. Now, we want to get down to the nitty-gritty of false teaching and why it exists, what it looks like, and how we can identify it when it shows up. Um, The reason I use, as I said earlier, the New King James Version is the word zealous is very much like the Greek zelao, which is found three times in ver- between verses 17 and 18. So there is this enthusiasm that is used in some English translations to translate this. There is this motivating zeal that interestingly does identify false cults many times. Jehovah Witnesses will come to your door with their blasphemous lie that Jesus Christ is merely a man and not God. And uh, when you dispute with them, they'll say, well, if you think you're right, why aren't you all going door to door? They assume that their zeal to make proselytes after themselves in order to put them into bondage for the rest of their life serving the Watchtower Society proves that they're right. But communists have zeal. Uh, People that want to overthrow just about anything that's good or right have zeal. A lot of people that are totally misguided in cults have zeal. And here in Galatians, the false teachers had zeal. And we're not in a contest. Well, I'm more motivated than you are. I work harder than you do. I went to more doors than you did. And, okay, so great. Matthew 23 says they travel all over the world trying to make a proselyte. And when they have one, that proselyte is more of a child of hell than they are. That's what Jesus said. Do you remember Jesus, gentle Jesus, meek and mild? Told it as it is. Why? Why are they so zealous, the false teachers, that is, to make you their convert? They want to exclude you. Now, the word there is an important one in the original, and it means to be closed out or shut out. One of the definitive things about cults and false teachings is that it shuts people out from just about anything else. Those who rule over you with their teachings that aren't clear from the Scripture force you to go to them for reinforcement. They set up systems where you have to go there or you are on the outs. The true gospel isn't copyrighted by some certain group and nobody else gets to have it. The true gospel is free And it's preached all over the world, and we run into people who are excited about it wherever we might go. And nobody's excluded other than if they just can't stand to hear the gospel. We don't have to set up a system to keep people out. They want to exclude you, close you out, shut you out. You come to them, or you don't get what you need. They they create the idea of a need psychologically, and they'll even cut people away from their own families and what have you. It's one of the 
um, calling cards of cults. They they isolate people. That uh, so why do they want to shut you out or close you out? That you might be zealous for them. They want all of the money, all of the attention, all the obedience. There's nothing free about it, but they're according to Galatians five one putting you under the yoke of bondage. So they demand submission to themselves as necessary for fellowship. We'll see this in the applications. This is always the way it works. Frankly, after 40 years or more, it's amazing how this repeats itself in every kind of a scenario that you might run across. It continually repeats itself. Exclude, exclude, exclude. Demand, 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 and shame anybody who doesn't submit to the people who made themselves God's lawgivers. And we're really isolated from that and are protected from it by the Lord and by his gospel. One of the passages that protects us is, and I don't have this in my um, applications, but just make another one. First Corinthians 14. We've been doing a lot of work with Luther, and Eric and I often cite Luther in our radio show, and then we just did some recording this week um, about Luther's false idea of infant baptism, and so we thought we should deal with what we agree with and what we don't. Well, his point was that you you may all prophesy only by two or three and let the others judge. That's from 1 Corinthians 14. Prophecy, as I understand it, and I believe this is a biblical idea, is to bring forth implications and applications of Scripture. And if the, if the flock is trained in the Word of God, and someone stands up and says, I'm the religious authority, here's what it is, and here's the way it's got to be, trying to cite some sort of biblical um, justification, this flock, the saints, anybody, you don't have to be a prelate, a bishop, an archbishop, a monsignor, a pastor, an elder, or anything. All you need to do is be a member of the flock, can judge that as to whether it's valid or invalid. And so Luther made an application and said the Pope is not preaching the gospel, so therefore any person, any Christian, can say to the Pope, your prophecy is false. Be silent in the church. You can imagine that was real popular back in those days. Well, I think we can say the same thing about anybody, uh, including Luther. So uh, by demanding submission to themselves, they're excluding the flock, these Judaizers, from being able to judge prophecy. And all you can do is judge whether or not this guy's ha- or, or these people are happy with you. That's all you can judge because it's not coming from Scripture. I, I alluded to Matthew twenty three fifteen. That's the one about going around looking for proselytes. They exclude those who fail to adopt their doctrine. It was either Paul or the Judaizers. They are incompatible. There's a if you took Eric's logic class, a disjunctive syllogism this is a valid either or. Let's go to verse 18. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing, always. And not only when I'm present with you. Now let's just think of the example I gave about Jehovah's Witnesses. They, they said, well, we would knock on more doors. We work harder. We give more money to the Watchtower Society. Look at everything we did. And look at you. You're pretty pathetic. All you are is a born-again Christian. Yes, and thank you. I think I will remain that way. (laughs) I'm going to get into a works contest to see if I knock on more doors than the JWs do. I'm not going to do it. And it's amazing the amount of effort people will put into false teachings. And so as Christians, we want to be consistently zealous for the gospel, whether or not Whoever first brought it to us, in their case, Paul, is physically present. The gospel is the gospel is the gospel. And when we preach it, we show that we're anointed by the Holy Spirit because one of the 
most uh, compelling evidences for the work of the Spirit is that Christ is confessed and the gospel is preached. That's when they asked Jesus about John the Baptist, uh, inquiry about Jesus. Jesus said the gospel is preached to the poor. Messiah is on the scene of history. So in these verses, we have this uh, verb, zelao, three times. So Paul would rejoice in rightly directed zeal. He's not calling for apathy or lethargy, but zeal is directed toward the gospel itself, not the kind of zeal the false teachers had for their law works and their desire for ungodly domination. Verse 19, Galatians 4, still from the New King James Version. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again and until Christ is formed in you. So he addresses them directly. He addresses them with terms of deep affection. Kind of an unusual figure of speech for a man talking about having birth pains because that's something he would not have personally experienced but it's a term used here in the a, a verb form the noun is found a number of times concerning the events leading up to the return of the Lord but here his deep affection comes out he really cares about them he's used some pretty harsh terms really and the more you study it in the original language, the harsher it is. It doesn't get softened. And there's a reason for that, but he never gives up on them. He calls them brothers many times. Here are little children. He doesn't give up on people who at one time had confessed the gospel, and maybe they've been led astray, or maybe some really bad things have happened. But he believes that God will complete the work, and he addresses them in this way of labor pains. And he wants to see Christ formed in them, and there's some irony here. It says if they have to be converted again. Earlier in Galatians 4, 9, he talked about reverse conversion, converted back to the pedagogos or pedagogos and the stoichia and the tutors and everything that was true before when they were under the curse now they are under Christ. Now they are free. Now they are blessed. Now they have the gospel. Now they're not under the yoke of bondage. Now they are liberated from serving religious leaders, serving spiritual forces of darkness, and serving, serving, serving. And when they get done, all they have is their lost condition. They're free from that. Why go back? Why go back under the curse? Why go back under something that had never liberated anybody anyhow? So it's a very unusual metaphor, and it's a very strong one. And um, he'd used other metaphors in, in the book of Galatians, but all of this is bringing them to face-to-face -to -face with the issue. Now, I'll... The next section I'll preach from in Galatians is going to be the Hagar-Sarah um, allegory that Paul talks about that finishes out chapter 4. I'll do that all in one sermon. I'm still thinking about how I'll lay that out, but it's really one big idea. We have the status of being free and liberated. Do we want to keep it or do we want to go back under some human lawgivers? Verse 20. I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Paul it really is harsh with the Galatians in this book. He, he very much is harsh. But he's also endearing and loving, and he calls them brothers a number of times. And here he says, I'd, I'd like to be present. You know when you're present with somebody, they can read body language. They can see if you're smiling. They can uh, understand if you're expressing loving, fatherly concern, as Paul is, that that's the way it really is, that you can explain something carefully. I believe that every single member of the body of Christ 
who's called in the scripture, purchased with a price, blood bought children of God, sons and daughters of the king, are precious in God's sight. How we care for one another and how we care for the Lord's flock says an awful lot about our motives and our hearts. We should genuinely have love and care and concern for each one whom the Lord has saved. Does the Lord ever save any troubled people? Just me? Is the Lord patient towards us? Absolutely. Does that mean that he endorses sin? No. But God is at work in us to change us. You see, false teachers come in and pray, P-R-E-Y, on the efforts of others. Their target is the church, which was purchased by the blood of Christ. Who was it that went into Asia Minor? He was stoned there and left for dead. Paul paid a, a huge price, but he came and he shared the gospel. And after the fact comes these people who invested nothing. And so you've got to listen to us. Paul's misleading you. You need to keep the Mosaic Law. It's wicked, but that's just how it goes. He says, I would like to be present with you now. Change my tone. There'll be one back. He hopes to see them saved from shipwreck on the spiritual rocks of deception. Why? Why is this so important? I've run into this a number of times. As I was preparing the sermon, I thought of something that happened in 2008. I was asked to speak at a conference, so I was out in California, and uh, actually in San Juan Capistrano, and I had a a table as one of the speakers, and I had the first book that I wrote, and it was about purpose driven, right down the road from the the church where the whole purpose driven thing was born. And mostly it was fairly well received, but this fellow came and was just livid. I thought he was going to have a heart attack. I had a couple of volunteers helping me with the table, and they were shocked. This guy was pounding on my table. We, you're a wicked man. Why would you write this book? What is wrong with you? How could you do this? And he was just literally screaming at me. And I said, well, w- wait a second. Wait, wait. He just would not. Yeah, I said, have you read the book? Here, I'll just give you one. No, I won't touch this book. It's evil. So I had disagreed with his hero. And I said, I'm not trying to pull the wood over anybody's eyes. I'm just contending for gospel preaching. Aren't you in favor of gospel preaching? And I'm disagreeing with a philosophy of ministry that says the church has to be pleasing to the community around before the gospel's ever preached to anybody, if it ever is. And he was so angry. He'd walk, stomp out, and then come back later and blast me again. And he, I, I, I just couldn't do anything. And there is an ethos in evangelicalism that I've seen a lot of places and cases that suggests that it's some sort of a social failure and a wicked thing to correct error. Never, never, never correct error. That's what we've been told. But we don't have any precedent for that. And to, in order to adopt that philosophy, don't correct error no matter what you do. We'd have to say Paul was seriously wrong. James was wrong. John was wrong. Peter was wrong. Jesus was wrong. And we shouldn't follow through with what we've been told to do to guard a flock against the wolves. And then things are thrown up in your face. Did you go talk to this person in person? And that's what was one of the things this guy was saying. Well, that was, well, I don't know what time of the year it was. Within a few months, I actually did. I went to, for, uh, went and talked to Rick Warren in person, gave him my book, 
and, sh and pleaded with him to preach the gospel. He treated me a lot better than his follower did, I'll tell you that. He didn't get apoplectic. He took the book, listened to me preach the gospel. I don't know what's going to come of it, but the fact is, this is about the gospel. This isn't about kingdom building, making yourself important, getting a big audience, selling books, any of these sort of things. It's only about the gospel. And you would think that asking someone to preach Christ wouldn't offend them. The one thing all Christians desire to do is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ by preaching the gospel. I have three implications and applications here. False teachers demand submission to themselves. I said that earlier. It is good and beneficial thing to correct error. I was just saying that. And beware of misplaced zeal. And we have a passage for that. Look at Matthew eleven sixteen and 17. This gets to the heart of the matter. The Lord had sent to Israel John the Baptist and Jesus, right? Well, here is a child's game that they'd play in the village because on occasion there'd be a wedding party and on another occasion there'd be a funeral. So they were, play excuse me. They were playing this game, wedding or funeral, all right? The wedding would have a certain kind of... Um, music and generally the girls like to play that game in the funeral when you know the boys like that one and they had the dirge but they play these games so here's what jesus said matthew eleven sixteen to 17 but to what shall i compare this generation it is like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to the other children so we have an analogy here it's like this and they say, we played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sing a dirge, and you did not mourn. Now, notice that phrase, this generation. I should have highlighted that. If you look for that in the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, it's not talking about a certain time period. It's talking about the spiritual condition of Israel's leadership. So the ones who were rejecting both John the Baptist and Jesus were Israel's rebellious leaders who wouldn't listen to God's prophets. And they're called this generation, later called this evil generation, this perverted generation. They won't listen to God. So here comes John the Baptist sent by God, and they don't like him because he was out in the wilderness kind of an ascetic, and they said, ah, oh, he's, he's totally nuts. He's probably got a demon, or who knows what all's wrong with John the Baptist. We're not going to listen to him. So Jesus comes, the prophet of God, the apostle of God, in fact, the very son of God, and he dies with sinners. He goes to the banquets. He eats and drinks with the sinners, Luke chapter 5. Because he came to call sinners to repentance. And they said, well, he's a glutton and a wine-bibber, this Jesus. And so it didn't matter what sort of prophet God sent to this generation. They'd find something wrong and say, I won't listen to him. Now, this is wicked judgment. Because if they speak for God authoritatively, and it can be proven that they do, then that's why we have to listen to them. We can't say, oh, I won't listen to him. I don't, I don't know. He didn't wear a suit and tie. It goes on in verses 18 and 19, which I don't have a slide for. For John came neither eating nor drinking. They said he has a demon. Verse 19, the son of man came eating and drinking. And they said a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax gatherers and sinners, but Jesus said, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Both John the Baptist and Jesus spoke for God, the true gospel, and called sinners to repentance. And they ought to have been listened to. But false teachers are saying, I'll hold the hoop, jump. 
I'll tell you what to do. Do it. That's all you need to know. So can you see why Luther was so revolutionary? Teaching that the lowliest saint can say to the Pope, you got the gospel wrong, therefore be silent in the church. Whoops. That'll cost you your head. But see, that's the beauty of the authority of Scripture. It's something that applies to each of us and it's liberating. The next point, it's a loving thing to correct error. Look at James 5, 19 and 20. That fellow that was so angry with me out there in California obviously doesn't believe this. I'm not trying to destroy anybody. I'm trying to get them to preach the gospel if they believe it. James 5, 19 and 20. My brothers, my, br- my brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Isn't that interesting? What does it say elsewhere in the New Testament? Love covers a multitude of sins. And to ask someone to be true to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to teach the scripture clearly and forthrightly without equivocation and to make applications that are binding because they logically and necessarily follow from the scripture is a very loving thing because that's how you turn back the one who strays and missed the mark who is straight from the truth. Turn back here is a term we've seen in Galatians, epistrapho. It's a term for conversion. And this will be a godly and good thing. And occasionally, it actually happens successfully. I'd have to say in the years that I've been writing and, and, and contending for the faith, there have been some cases that were exciting. I got a call from a fellow um, five or six or seven years ago, but he had read, I don't know if he read a book or an article or listened to a radio show, but he called me and he said, you know, I was going to go down this path of seeker-sensitive and purpose-driven and try to get everything changed, change the music, change the message, change the seating, change everything so that People would be happy even if they're not Christian. They'd want to be a part of the church. And he says, and I read your articles and I realized I can't justify this biblically and I'm not going to do it. We're going to be a gospel church. So occasionally that happens and it's well worth all the effort. God is a compassionate God. Think about Ezekiel 33.11. You can jot this down or if you, if you can look it up. Ezekiel 33, 11, quote, Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? God is a loving and compassionate God, interested in covering a multitude of sins, who lovingly calls us to himself. When we stray from him, he shows us compassion. He sends people to bring us back. He doesn't leave us in our miserable state. He makes a way of forgiveness and life. Yeah, one more slide. And I want to share the gospel as part of this, but let's start with the passage. Romans ten two through 4. For I testify about them. Now he's talking about his brethren according to the flesh, the Israelites. That was the topic in Romans 9, and it was also his heart's prayer was for their salvation. So that's the context. I testify about them that they have a zeal, there's our word from the Greek, that we saw three times in the passage in Galatians. They have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. 
for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. This is precisely what was going on in Galatia. The Judaizers say, no, you can't have the imputed righteousness of Christ. You can't have freedom. If you're not circumcised, you're obviously not pleasing God. If you're not keeping the Jewish Sabbath, you're not pleasing God. If you're not obeying the law of Moses, you're not pleasing God. And you can't claim that God imputes the righteousness of Christ to our account and brings us to himself through the blood atonement once for all. They're wanting to add works. Now, here's people who have never been converted, uh, the Jewish people, and they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge in the sense of knowing God's way of forgiveness and cleansing. They didn't know about the once-for-all shed blood of Jesus Christ. Once for all is such a great word in the New Testament. I love that word. The Greek is hapax, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. It says in 1 Peter 3.18, Christ died for sins once for all. And if you look that Greek word of hapax, it means once and never again. In Hebrews, it uses the term once for all several times because contrasting the old covenant they had to keep doing it over and over and over. They take the scapegoat, have the Day of Atonement, put the blood on the mercy seat, send the sins out into the wilderness for, to show expiation, to pour the blood on the mercy seat to show propitiation, satisfying God's wrath. Expiation is removal of guilt and sin. But they had to do it the next year, and the next year, and the next year, and the next year. And the author of Hebrews said, well, it didn't go away. It didn't really cleanse. It prefigures the true cleansing that comes through Jesus Christ. And so those with the zeal for God would say, no, you have to go back and do these other things. You can't believe that it would even be possible that God would accept us because of the righteousness of Christ who lived a sinless life, that this would be the end of the law. Now, there's some debate about the word end, telos. It can mean termination, or it can mean goal. The goal of the law was that Christ would come and fulfill the law. That's true. Or it can mean termination. When Christ comes, that's the end of the law for righteousness. That's true also. So perhaps it's a combination of both. This is a righteousness that's called rightly an alien righteousness. It's his righteousness imputed to our account. It comes from God through divine imputation. We saw that in Galatians. Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. And so they want to have righteousness, but they want to do it by their own works. And really, all you have is your own sin and failure. It never actually justifies. The law did not provide a way to arrive at right standing before God. Remember that phrase, right standing before God. That's the issue. That is the key in the book of Romans. The term righteousness has a range of meanings, but one of the more important ones in Romans is right standing before God. This is what started the Reformation with Luther finding that in Romans. You mean justice is God's acceptance of Christ? who lived a perfectly sinless life for me? Yes. Luther feared God's justice. It it caused him sorrow and misery, endless efforts of works over and over and over to no avail. The guilt was there. The shame was there. The hopelessness was there. 
But he read one time, finally, my just one will live by faith and believed it. That's the gospel. When we preach Christ, we're preaching his person and his work and his promises. His person being that Christ is the creator. He created the world out of nothing. That claim is made in one, excuse me, in John chapter 1, verse 3, and in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. He, he's the creator. He existed from all eternity. In John 1, 1, when it says he was with God, the, the Greek preposition pros, there means face to face with God in that context. The Father and the Son from all eternity in perfect fellowship. John claims that this one is the one who came into this world and that he was full of grace and truth, which is an allusion to the Mount Sinai when God revealed himself to Moses as one full of said and a meth. Grace and truth would be one way to translate that. When uh, I like the fact that I get emails from people who aren't Christians who want to attack the gospel or questioning it. That's my chance to witness without being able to fly all over the world because the email goes all over the world. I've had one going lately with a guy about the resurrection. And we should be able to answer these things, don't you think? We should be able to answer the reason for the hope we have. And one thing that I was saying to this fellow, I was questioning it, Jesus predicted his own resurrection from the dead. Nobody else did that. No other world leader did that. Muhammad didn't do that. He wasn't raised, and he didn't predict any resurrection. But Jesus did, and even his critics claimed he predicted it. He said, tear this down, tear this temple down and rebuild it in three days. That was a reference to his body, to the resurrection. And he appeared to many witnesses. Christianity is not a religion of mythology. We don't consider myths worthy of being believed. We don't demand that people believe Christian myths just because we want to be the dominant religion. We're pleading with people to be reconciled to God, but the basis is what God actually did in Christ in reconciling the world to himself. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So this Jesus who lived a sinless life, who existed from all eternity, was raised and bodily ascended into heaven. He appeared to many witnesses. What's the point of all this? Every human being from Adam on was under the wrath of God and facing eternal judgment you find this in the New Testament. It's one of my beefs with the seeker-sensitive movement. They don't talk about the wrath of God. But it's so prominent in the New Testament, how can you ignore it? Even in John 3, where we love to quote John 3, 16, it says later in the same chapter, the one who doesn't believe the wrath of God abides on him. Paul talks about the wrath of God in the book of Ephesians. We're saved from what? From an unhappy life, from not having enough friends, not having enough money. No, we're saved from God's wrath against sin for all eternity. The gift of God is eternal life. That's the promise. People believe this only if they're convicted by the preaching of the gospel and the work of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus ascending into heaven one of the things that we know is he's coming again to bring judgment to those who hate him and reject him and salvation to those who believe in him. Do you believe that Jesus Christ keeps his promises? He came to, he's coming again. And he will indeed do everything he said he'll do. So we ask through the Lord, not on our own accord, that if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you would repent and believe the gospel. We saw words called turn. 
We turn from serving self, idols, this world, whatever is important to us, and we come to God on his terms and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation from God's wrath against sin. And the positive side of it is the imputation of God's righteousness. He considers us righteous because we're trusting in Christ's finished work. That, my dear friends, is the gospel. And I love it so much that it doesn't make me seem, in my own mind, redundant because I preach it every time I preach. I feel a divine necessity to do so. That God will use the gospel to save those who believe. <clears throat> Let's pray, and then I'll have you stand for the benediction, but we'll pray first. Dear Lord, I pray that as these words have gone forth, words of hope through the gospel, good news through the gospel, that your Holy Spirit would convict hearts, those who know you, that we'd be convicted, that we don't need all this other stuff out there that beckons us, but we can trust in your finished work. And we pray for those who don't know you, that today they would believe on the gospel and find the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life and righteousness before you through the free gift of the imputation of Christ's righteousness. We need this. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share it. And we thank you, dear Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. I believe they're preparing a meal for us out there. This will be from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, the benediction. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, and we'll have some more fellowship yet today. So you're invited to join us.